And as Michael put in the chat there, everyone, we're starting to see people do it. Thank you, Dorothy. And thank you, Aaron. Uh, but if you're in our session, we'd love to know who's in here. Uh, please, if you can, uh, put your name in the chat and let us know your role in education in your location. And we're hoping at the end of our session, you'll also be kind enough to give us a question for our panel here today after we present for a little bit. Uh, so our, our presentation today is called, Why Do Students Leave High School? Why Do They Stay? Let's ask them. And we're gonna talk to you today about a really cool study we did this summer and the pre preliminary findings from it, uh, from this qualitative study we did this summer. Uh, and how our format will go today is uh, we will tell you a little bit about our school and we'll spend some time talking about the study. And at the end of the session, our hope is we'll have about 15 minutes to answer questions, but we would love to encourage everyone that as we go, uh, feel free to pop questions in the chat. We probably won't take them until the end, uh, but we will, when we, we will return to them when we get to that point. So without further ado, I would like to start us off by uh, introducing the executive director from the High School for Recording Arts, Tony Simmons, who's gonna get us started and introduce our team. Tony, take it away. Great, great. Thank you, Joey. And it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you all around the country, um, figuring out how to um, support, advocate for uh, our independent char public charter schools, as well as the young people who attend and their families and their community. Uh, that's what we're all about. I'm proud to be here with three of my esteemed colleagues, um, Joey Chenyan, who's our education director at High School for Recording Arts, Michael Lipset, our director of social impact and who led this study, and Amanda Galloway, who's our lead advisor at High School for Recording Arts. Um, we're really excited to share this research project. So um, why do students leave? Why, why, why do they stay? Let's ask them. It's literally the essential questions that led to the, to the creation of High School for Recording Arts. Um, for those of you not familiar with um, High School for Recording Arts, we were founded over 20 years ago in St. Paul, Minnesota. And we basically chose to meet a need in our community. Um, David T.C. Ellis, who's the founder of High School for Recording Arts, grew up in St. Paul. Um, he had been um, bounced around from school to school and eventually ended up at a, at a place called St. Paul Open School, which was a small experiential, experimental school in St. Paul that finally took the time to get to know him and listen to him, ask him questions about himself and what he wanted to learn. And his life was transformed. Um, after that, he pursued an uh, interest in music, um, ended up performing with his childhood buddy, a kid named Prince, became um, the first uh, person to put out a rap song in, in Minnesota and to perform with Prince all over the world and in the movie. So from there, um, David was, in, was just in the music business. I met him at that time. I was practicing law as an entertainment attorney. He was on the East Coast promoting his album and um, invited me out to Minnesota to, to work with him at Paisley Park and other things that he was doing which included opening up a recording studio. And he called that studio, Studio Four. And his whole aim was just to be in the music business. And I was just there to help him um, realize that dream. But over time, young people started showing up every day. They were passionate about wanting to know more about the music business, how to get their music out, how to copyright their music, all of these things. But these were young people, and David would notice that they would be there all day. And he would ask, why aren't you in school? And they would say, school is boring. Um, I got kicked out. And this is what I wanna learn anyway. And David was like, well, sure, but you still need to know how to you know, read and do math because the music industry is sometimes a little shady and you, know, you don't wanna just turn that over to me like your lawyers. You didn't want to understand those things for yourself and school is important in that pursuit of knowledge. And it was like, oh, well, I, I'm willing to do that to understand how to be in the music business. So we literally were asking them these questions, which led David to say, 
why don't we build a school here at our studio? And that's when we created the High School for Recording Arts. And since then, we've learned so much more about these young people who all across the country are pushed and kicked out of schools. Over 5 million young people at any given time aren't in school. And we recognize that that has a lot to do, that marginalization, that oppression of their, their opportunity to um, pursue a free and public education that's denied is something that, um, the, that has to be addressed. And for us at High School for Recording Arts, not only have we done it in terms of our programming and meeting those needs that those young people talked about, but for us, it's also just as important to fight for the policy initiatives to support the work we do, and also to have the research backing up the results of what we're achieving. And that's what led to um, me serving actually on the board of an organization called Education Evolving and um, meeting Ted Coultry, who um, founded Education Evolving, and also the um, Center for uh, Policy Design, and, um, and him having this question about why young people leave school and what will it take for them to stay, and invited us to be a part of a research project with a great partner, Wilder Foundation, which is literally across the street from our school, to ask um, these young people those questions. And for our part, we asked our students who for over 20 years, we've been uh, engaging them around those questions. And this is the time I turn over to my colleagues to really unpack what that research um, was able to um, um, decipher, what we learned from them and how it may work and impact some of the things that you're doing in your community and with young, young people, because we hope that this is this is something that can spread so that we could really build the understanding and, and make the case to our policymakers and others so that we could better have schools support these young people. So without any further ado, Joey, Michael, Amanda, take it away. Thank you, Tony. Um, and to build a little bit, before we jump into the research project, uh, we'll have Michael take the baton next. But before we jump into that, we wanted to just frame this context of this discussion with some of the really important values that our school has had since the very beginning uh, and has helped us to stay focused on our mission to serve students who have been uh, pushed or kicked out of any other schools that they had been to and have found themselves disengaged from their education. And so our school has four values, you know, as Tony said, it was originally called Studio Four, and those four, that four in that moniker really links to these four key things that we talk about a lot within our student community. Uh, family, respect, community, and education. Our students know them, and we continually return to these ideas to check ourselves to make sure that uh, we are staying true to our mission and that our mission is rooted in stuff that is gonna help students engage back in high school and to have a sense of belongingness and have a sense of acceptance and success. And uh, you can see here in the slide, it kind of depicts it, but with family, we believe learning is best nurtured when there's a feeling of belongingness. You're gonna see a lot of this stuff represented in the research too. Uh, with respect, our culture is predicated on the belief that each of us matter and our histories and the spaces we occupy matters. With community, we really value that students contribute to the community, which, which supports their learning through mentorships and jobs, but also that they have power within the community in which they learn in and the school itself. And education, we obviously have a student teacher partnership approach that develops lifelong learning. And at our school, we really focus on a lot of arts engagement, specifically through the recording arts and other creative en endeavors. And as we've developed over the years, we've refined some of these points within our school culture to expand them to very specific strategic things that we think helps engage our students and empowers them to be change makers in the community and successful within our space. And in that context, these are four of our pillars that we look at every year to make sure that the choices we're making in our pedagogy and our staff structure and the way we communicate with students and the way we share power really channels these four pillars. Um, to go into them briefly, we are asset based. So when we look at our students, instead of seeing a deficit to fix, we really begin by building strong relationships and recognize the genius in each young person. This is foundational for us, and you'll see it in the research as well, represented in what students want to see in a school. 
Um, we're very big on wraparound services. Uh, many of our students are coming from fragile homes and communities, chaotic situations, uh, where they're dealing with a lot of hierarchy of needs on the outside uh, when they show up for school. Uh, and we want to provide support such as food, clothing, housing, mental health resources, and community connections that helps our students do what they need to do to be successful in our space and to get the help that they need on their journey to self-empowerment and into adulthood. Uh, we also are very, we, we put an enormous amount of, of pressure on ourselves to create innovative practices. Inherent in hip hop culture is the need to stay fresh, particularly with youth culture. And so we need to constantly remix and redefine what we're doing with our students based on what they want and what they need to be successful. And so to support learning, we provide students with connections to the recording industry, partnerships, a lot of community-based learning, but we really stretch ourselves internally to have interesting pedagogy. And we'll talk about that a little bit more with the research as well. And last, but certainly not least, we have a social justice lens to everything we do. We know it is intrinsic to our mission to be social justice focused. And for our students, we want them to be change makers in the community and to participate in the political dialogue that really is impacting their lives every second of the day. So we provide creative space to confront societal injustices that many of our students are experiencing on a regular basis, but also to empower our students to act as community change agents. We want them to learn to use the freedom of our school of expression and a lot of the power that they, that they intrinsically have to impact the community around them and to take a stand on things that they find to be unjust, unfair, uh, and, and in a direction of righteousness. So those are some of the, the cultural uh, foundations of our school uh, and some of the uh, pillars that we really value. And we wanted to show you guys that at the very beginning here because we think it'll help you to situate the research we did. You'll have a frame of reference to return to. So now I'm going to pass to Mike Lipset and he's going to take it away and talk a little bit about the study. And Amanda and I, throughout the course of this, will chime in and give you guys some context. Amazing. Thank you so much, Joey. So just to return to the top of the research project as one uh, that we'd like to frame within the context of our high school, but also within the context of specific research questions, it's important to begin with the research questions themselves. And those were, what is it about current schooling that propels student departure or leads students to go from one school either out of schooling altogether or from one school to another school like ours? And also, what is it about schools that students choose to attend instead that draws them in, re-engages them, and keeps them there? You can go to the next slide. We asked of our student participants, why did you leave your last high school? Again, the High School for Recording Arts is a re-engagement program. We do accept students that have not been pushed out of other schools that have an interest in enrolling, but we are a, a, a school that exists explicitly to serve young people who've been pushed and kicked out of other schooling institutions. So we asked, why did you leave your last high school? Tell me about your relationships with adults at your last high school. Tell me about the services or supports you access, accessed while at your last high school. How safe or unsafe did you feel? And were your academic, extracurricular, and or career interests acknowledged and developed there? Describe what your ideal high school would be like. You can go to the next slide, Bill. In order to frame our findings, we adopted a relatively new framework to both uh, filter what, we've, what we were seeing and hearing from the students, but also um, conceptualize and organize what we were hearing, right? And so we, we picked this framework of actually push, pull, and stick factors that comes from migration studies that takes a much more systemic level approach to the movement of people from one place to another. We saw parallels between this term push out um, that is used in the re-engagement space to remove the onus of students leaving schools from the student themselves and place it back on the school system to say, hey, if a student is no longer engaged in a school, it's not their fault, it's the school's fault, and thus something has led to them being pushed out. We also saw a parallel between what is known as stick rate in the re-engagement sector, or the rate at which a school is able to retain newly enrolled students from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and the connection between stick rate and stick factors when people move from one location to another. What is it that causes them to stay in that location? It made sense then to look at, if we could go back 
uh, one slide quick, pull factors as well. What draws students to a new school so that we can understand the things that are not just pushing students out or leading them to stay at a new location, but drawing them into that location as well. And now we can move on. So we interviewed 30 young people using a YPAR method, youth participatory research, which basically had young people, our students, interviewing fellow students. We did this because we didn't want our students to feel the pressure of commenting on the High School for Recording Arts to people who work at the High School for Recording Arts. That we felt might Im imbue bias within our findings, um, but we also knew that students could probably discuss their schooling experiences with other students far more easily than we as adults could have that same conversation with them. And we were interested in finding out what we could uncover um, about student experiences between student conversations as opposed to between students and adults. And we can move on here. Of those 30 students, we interviewed 10 current students, 10 alumni, and 10 students who have actually left the high school for recording arts without graduating. Um, there was gender parity throughout these 30 students. Racially, those 30 students were uh, 26 black or African American students. There was one white student, two indigenous students, and one Latinx student. 30 students, for the record, at the High School for Recording Arts is just under 10% of our entire student population. Um, we organized our findings by themes and sub-themes and connected our, oh sorry, and our interviews were conducted right through the YPAR method. So we can move to the next slide. A quick point on some quantitative research that we did through this research project. We uh, worked with the, with MNIC, and Joey, I forget what that acronym stands for, um, but they were able to crunch some data for us on the number of schools that our, our students had attended um, prior to enrolling at the High School for Recording Arts. And what we actually found out was that the average student at the High School for Recording Arts had attended four some high schools before enrolling with us. So just to give you an idea of the educational trajectory of the students that we not only serve, but that were involved in this study. And, and that acronym is the Minnesota Internship Center and we work with some of their staff there, Joe Billings in particular. Great, thank you. We can go to the next slide. Here. Um, and this is just to say that for seven of the nine students that we, uh, that, that we worked with, enrollment at HSRA was their longest stretch of high school without dropping out or changing schools. Um, and that is not to say that that's representative of the entire student population, but it is to suggest that there is likely some more research to be done here to see if and how HSRA is effective at helping students stabilize their education. We'll keep, keep going. So now we want to jump into uh, what we found to be push, pull, and stick factors between conventional schools first and what in our study were known as alternative schools or in most specifically our school, the high school for recording arts. So through our student interviews we found that push factors of conventional schools really boiled down to a lack of caring relationships that manifested themselves in the presence of adults in conventional schools who appeared to simply be checking into their professions, their jobs for a check. Um, there was a lack of these caring relationships that manifested between the schools and their families. Um, it is also showed up in the passive wraparound services that students were offered rather than active wraparound services, which you'll see when it comes to stick factors in alternative schools. Students would show up to their school counselor, for example, and feel like they were just checking boxes. The things that students actually needed um, did not seem to be things that the school was invested in providing in, a, in an in-depth and rigorous way. Students also demonstrated a lack of safety uh, as well as a cultural disconnect between themselves, the curriculum, and the staff in the school, all of which contributed to a feeling that the school did not necessarily push them academically. Um, and I want to pause here and allow Joey or Amanda to, to chime in and comment if they could. Sure, and I, I'll do it briefly and then I'll pass to you, Amanda, because I think this is an important one. Um, you know, a lot of our students, this is, this is where they spent in a lot of the interviews a lot of time talking. You know, many of our students experienced academic, what we call like uh, trauma in schools, uh, academic-based trauma. And, and when you look at this stuff, they tell their stories. They just, so many students throughout their, their school career, particularly when they get to high school, but it really transcends back into middle school and grade school, have stories where they just felt like 
nobody saw them and they felt, and, and sometimes it was structural in the sense that uh, a lot of students tell stories where they shuffle from class to class with big classrooms and they didn't really get an opportunity to build connections with a lot of staff, particularly teaching staff. But sometimes it was much more relational where we heard a lot of stories from young people who had a very traumatic incident with a teacher, with some, with an administrator, with someone on the disciplinary side, where it was significant enough that it stuck with them through their high school career. And for many of them was an impetus to not only uh, either drop out or to try to change schools right away, which we know is enormously disruptive to a young person's life. Uh, Amanda, you can take it from there. Yeah, definitely. Um, it was interesting, you know, the conversations, I was kind of a fly on the wall <laughs> in the background during these interviews. And I heard repeatedly um, from students that they uh, would test teachers at times to kind of even see if anybody saw them. I know one student talked about being in class and putting their head down just to see if a teacher would wake them up. They thought they were sleeping. Um, another one said that she sat there forever and nobody even spoke to her. You know, people would continue to walk past. Um, a lot of people also talked about those wraparound services and they knew that those were available at the school, but nobody really ever really pushed those or offered them to the students as well too, which was um, disheartening to hear. Um, because a lot of the students that we're dealing with, uh, they, they need those supports, they need that help. So it was a lot different when they got to HSRA and we'll get into this a little bit more as we, as we talk, but um, they really didn't feel that way at our school. You know, you couldn't hide in the corner. Somebody was constantly going to say something to right. you and check in with you. It was kind of like annoying, but they, they wanted that as well too. So a lot of them talked about just wanting to be seen and felt like they were present. Yeah, and I think like like two ways we saw a lot of the conversation come through. It was like some of it was like some act active um, trauma with staff, and some of it was very passive. Like some of the stuff you're describing, Amanda, where it's just like people didn't come to them and see it. But we also heard stories of a student who went through something horrific with their family and came to school late the next day, or came to school after not being able to sleep. You know, students struggling with a lot of different things, but then showing up to class five minutes late and being humiliated in front of their peers or being banned, like the door being locked and being told that after all the work that they did to get to school that day, they'd have to go sit in the lunchroom and they would, and, and then they would have failed an assignment or they, you know, we heard stories of students who had been in school for a long period of time, but then had a major disruption where they lost housing. And then they had missed school for a week or two. And when the time they got back, they'd missed a test or they'd missed homework and the teacher didn't have a pathway for them to make it up and they just failed their class. And all the work that they had put in the month or two before was for naught because they had missed those two weeks for something outside of their control. And these stories, you know, like we interviewed 30 young people, but we, me and Amanda and obviously the rest of our team have met so many young people over the years who just have story after story of things that happen to them that stick with them, you know? So this is one we want to spend a little more time with because it was a really big push factor for a lot of the youth we talked to. Definitely. Okay, Mike, I'm going to jump to the next one. Yeah, wonderful. Additional uh, characteristics of this lack of caring relationships and staff seeing themselves simply as employees made their way into the education program, whether it was the education program that contributed to a lack of caring relationships or vice versa, I think is actually kind of a double-edged sword because what we found out was that a lot of teachers would just hand you a packet and walk away. Um, they were required to teach an inflexible credit earning system that led to impersonal learning of content that was rather irrelevant to the students in the first place. And when you're removed from that autonomy as an instructor, it's really difficult then to, you know, really dive into the students as individuals, provide them one-on-one -on -one support um, for content that you know they probably are not that invested or interested in. So from a, a didactic and siloed instructional a uh, framework that students are or that teachers are forced to operate in thus also came these this lack of caring relationships that students and teachers were were then forced to try and navigate together and joey i think that we'll actually go through the next slide before i have you you both jump back in as well students simultaneously rep, uh, commented on a lack of representation in, at the systemic level both through, through teachers, but also, also through school leaders, in, 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 and especially with regard to race, right? 
saying that there were just too many white people either in the staff at the leadership level or in the student population. They often felt labeled as deviant and disciplined simple, simply based on their race. This led to students feeling like there were threats of violence uh, from others, as well as fears that they themselves would become violent as a response to a toxic school environment. Um, a lot of our students sought smaller school environments precisely because they sought relationships. They wanted to be closer to the adults in the school. They wanted to understand that their peers were, were there for and with them. And in this sense, you know, a number of students said that the schools would actively push them out, saying that the school wanted to see all the quote, troubled kids gone, which we of course know is coded language far too often for schools interested in seeing uh, black, brown and indigenous students leave so that they can have an easier time managing their student population. Mm -hmm. So I'll invite Joey and Amanda back in here to comment. You can go ahead and start, Amanda. Sure. Yeah. I think it was really interesting, the people, the kids that spoke about their relationships that they built with teachers and or staff in other schools, um, they typically identified with like um, a support staff. Um, so, you know, they they spoke about wanting to relate you know they want to see somebody that looks like them they want to be able to relate to people and that was um those on the support team so um they they really want to connect with or see more teachers of color in in schools and things like that um joey i'm gonna tag you i have some other thoughts that'll pop in in a second <laughs> no no that's fine and i think like like that quote that's up there just here for a check that quote, we, we had so many students say that they had an experience the situation where a teacher was either so disgruntled or burned out in their job or frustrated in the moment that they literally said that to the student. Like, hey, I don't care if you do this work or not, I'm just here for a check. I'm gonna get paid at the end of the month whether you do this or not. And and every student we talked to, whether or not they, like they are, the students because of the youth participatory research were pretty blunt because they were talking to a young person their age. So they're like, well, I was really bad in this class and I did this, this and this, but you know, so like, Oftentimes, I think they per were perceived as young people who didn't care or as young people that weren't capable or as young people who weren't interested in being successful, where when they tell their own story, it, was, it couldn't be further from the truth. Mm -hmm. Like they heard, I'm just here for a check and they felt so disrespected, you know, and, and we heard that consistently. So that just must be way too prevalent within the school districts because, you know, we know in any school, even schools that are struggling, teaching staff really struggle, you know, it's, it's tough to be in working in a school in the contemporary environment. But another piece of that that came up over and over again, you know, to speak to what you were saying, Amanda, is like, kids felt we have interviewed predominantly kids of color, predominantly black students, and they just felt so targeted by their race. They felt at every level from grade school on up, they, they perceived racism in the classroom, so classroom, racism from people in positions of authority, racism of exclusion, and racism of being hyper-targeted for who they were and from what they perceived to be was very unfair. And sometimes they'd say, well, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. They labeled me a certain way, so I showed them that I was that way, but it really wasn't, you know? And, and as we got to know the students when they came to our school, it was true. They were like, you know, sweet young people, but they had been in a bad situation. Other times, like some of the stories that we heard about racism that kids were experiencing in schools, and, you know, we're talking about the last 10 years, it was just horrific. It's horrific what these young people went through. And um, it, it is very troubling to us as interviewers to look at this and see that there aren't a lot of schools where, where students feel that that weight taken off their shoulders where they feel isolated by their race and antagonized by their race there aren't a lot of spaces where they feel comfortable um, but they are asking for spaces like that where, where they can feel comfortable where they can feel seen where they can where they don't have to worry about um, who they are in their identity as as something that's going to be show up as a deficit but where they can show up who they are with their identity as something that's an asset um, right. that came up over and over and over again yes I think they were definitely surprised too coming into an environment, you know, I, I do orientation. So like coming into an environment where um, people are asking, um, what are you into? You know, they talked about never having that opportunity at another school where people asked those genuine questions about who they were. I, I just wanted to add something too. Um, a lot of times people think young people may use those types of um, um, reactions as excuses 
or to deflect, you know, it's, you know, they're just being racist. There's, they're just that, just that I've heard that a lot over, um, my time as an educator. But one thing we know from this research from our school and many of our, of the schools that are part of, um, the, our coalition, um, when those young people finally find a place that has anti-racist practices, they don't feel that way anymore, which I think is extremely validating of the fact that when they said it, it was real. It was something that really happened to them. It wasn't an, it wasn't an excuse for something or just to deflect because they would have then brought that into our space or your space. So I think it's very important for us to see how this research coming from um, places that have anti-racist practices as a, as a validation of what these young people have expressed to us. Absolutely. Awesome, let's jump to the next slide. So we don't wanna just harp on conventional schools and all that's challenging with them. I'm sure some of this, if not most of this is not new to, to many folks, but in recognition of what conventional schools do offer, a lot of our students saw sports offerings and college readiness programs, the more real world uh, programs offered at conventional schools as strong pull factors, reasons why they wanted to attend a conventional school. Those things that kept them there uh, however, we're really telling, as Amanda was commenting earlier, a lot of students said that the strongest relationships they had were with people that you wouldn't necessarily consider always to be the central figures in a student's educational trajectory. And those were people like the hall monitors or the custodial staff or the people who worked in the lunchroom. And they were also often, in most regularly, the only adults of color in the schools that our students attended. On a rare occasion, students did identify the teacher who taught an ethnic studies course or led a social justice oriented ex oh, Mike, I think you might be frozen on my end. Uh oh, mine too. Uh, but we'll, we'll jump in and speak to this too, because Amanda, you started bringing this up. I, I think like, Yes, I think students definitely resonated with um, with staff that had a similar experience to them, came had a similar racial background to them, and that was a significant part of those relationships, uh, which really celebrates the importance of diversity in a school. But also, it's the situation that oftentimes those were the staff that actually saw those students and took the time to get to know them, to know them by their name, and to have an authentic relationship with them. You know, and I don't know if Amanda, you want to speak a little bit further on that. Yeah, definitely. I think too, um, you know, they had the opportunity, like when you think about like a hall monitor, when would you be coming across this person? Like if you're kind of not really engaged and things like that, um, I think it allowed them to have those genuine conversations to figure out like what is going on with you as an individual in this moment. Um, and that person was that listening ear. They were there to support and, and help that student. Um, I think also with the, some of these pull factors, it points out like, you know, these are these are opportunities for kids to explore their passions, right? And their interests. And you're talking about they stayed at school because of sports. They were interested. They were motivated behind those things. College readiness, really looking at focus of the future, what they want to do and how they want to get there. Um, art classes, you know, they can explore their creativity that way. Um, so they, they really spoke on those things where they were able to be themselves in, in, in their program, so. Yeah, and I think like one thing that really stands out to me from what the students were telling and from exactly what you're saying, Amanda, is thinking about how important engagement of young people is it, spatially, it doesn't always fit into the very concrete schedule that a school will build so it can logistically deal with, you know, the number of young people and the amount of learning that they want to take place. Oftentimes those things that really help young people stick into a space happen in these hallway conversations, happen in the art room, happen in the lunchroom, happen after school, happen in the unstructured spaces that generally we, we could, to a fault, consider to be frivolous spaces or consider to be non-essential spaces. But to the students we interviewed, they were the most essential spaces for them to feel a sense of 
belongingness and a sense of acceptance and a sense of community. And those things we know translate into academic engagement as well. Right. So if a school doesn't take the opportunity to build those spaces in, it does so at the detriment of youth engagement, you know? Definitely. Mike, I think we got you back. Um, I'm gonna jump to the next slide and, and hopefully it's working again. You can you can jump back in. Perfect, thanks for, for covering for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what, what else drew students to, or what drew students to the high school for recording arts in the first place? Well, when they visited, they would say, this place feels like real life. They noted our small tight knit community. They noted our longer hours. They noted authentic responses from our staff to the real life challenges that students were facing without judgment or stigma. And I think that Amanda, uh, Joey, you'll have some really great contributions here in terms of what it is that those students are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I, I look at every student when they come into HSRA, right there, they get an advisor, right? Or they're working before the pandemic, right? Uh, they worked with me as, a, as an intake person kind of running the orientation. So during that process, when we first get a student, it's really sitting down with them and getting to know them as an individual. Tell me your story. What brings you here? What did you like about your last place? What did you dislike? Um, sometimes we, we got a little pushback on that, but it's really just that confusion within a kid. Like, what do you mean you're, you're actually wanting to get to know me, you know? And um, from that moment on, it's like, you know, the light bulb starts going off with the kids. Like, I have an opportunity to be in this space and and explore learning through things that are important and interesting to me. Like, this is this is real, right? A lot of times, um, it, people don't think that you can learn in that way, right? Thinking about your passions and your interests and things like that. But um, really, at our school, trying to find out those interests and and passions from the kids first really allow us to push them in the direction. Um, that will support them the best. Um, and, and this is really the spot where I think all schools, many schools do it well and all schools need to think about it. It's like, when we think about what we value and the way we structure our spaces and the way we set up our learning opportunities, um, what we're trying to do with these things, changing our hours, you know, we, we start at nine, we go to five, we go, often go much later. Um, where we create structures, like Amanda saying, we do front end engagement. So the student isn't just, you got here, okay, quick, get to math class, we'll figure that out later, maybe if we get to it. It's no, the most important thing is for you to find your people first mm -hmm. and to start to go through who you are and to start to unpack what you wanna get out of this. Um, doing those things on the front end, it shows that, that what we're interested in is putting a premium and putting an emphasis on student belongingness, building our community and student engagement first Mm -hmm. And because we know that that thing bookends directly to success with, with academic engagement, especially with many of the students we serve. If we try to say, well, you are behind four years in math, so we need to push you into math as quick as possible because you have so much to make up. It's, it's a failed prospect from the beginning because that is what pushed the student to jump from school to school to school before they got to us. Um, and we saw many, of, as Mike said earlier, we saw many of our students, we do every year, I think a lot of the other um, le school leaders that are in this room might see the same thing, who have gone from four or five different schools before they end up at our school. So we see like adjusting our schedule, adjusting our framework to what's going to work best for young people as super important to producing these pull factors, you know, and uh, Mike, I'm going to shift to the next slide because I think we'll have more to say with this one. Great. Additional pull factors uh, extended, of course, to the education program. Um, our art-based, project-based learning educational program takes student interests and, and places it right at the beginning of what it means to design a personal learning plan for each student that is interest that is student-centered. Right. Um, this translates to feelings of freedom, relevance. Uh, and students who want other students in their lives, other friends of theirs, other family members, to then come to the high school for recording arts. So it's, it, we also found that the number one draw was word of mouth. Students were so enthusiastic about the school and its offerings that they then shared that with their family and friends. We can move to the next slide, Joe. Right, and that quote is directly from a student. You know, like when you hear that, it's stuff you actually want to learn, stuff you can actually use. That's the feedback that we're looking for to know that our program's successful is that students are getting that feel from it. Yeah. 
And this actually leads us to what I found to be the most interesting uh, finding from, from this research project. And that is this notion of interpersonal press, which we contrast with academic press. And if you think about the, the responses we got from our students, and you compare them to the responses that they were giving with regard to their relationships that they held at conventional schools, the fact that students found one, maybe two adults in their conventional schools that they could connect with, and that those adults were not always central to their core academic program, as compared to the fact that students could name person after person, five, six, seven staff and teachers and adults at the High School for Recording Arts that they felt they had close relationships with, really stands as a testament to what Joey calls a, a relational pedagogy and what translates ultimately into this interpersonal press. Interpersonal press being high expectations for each student that can be leveraged as a result of the relational engagement felt between that student and the adult. Those expectations push students academically, but it's not an academic first push. It's not, as Joey said, you have four years of math to make up, that's our focus. No, it's who are you? What is your interest? What drives you and motivates you? What are you dealing with outside of school? And how can we support you in that? Which led to the importance of the wraparound services that we provide at the High School for Recording Arts as active wraparound services. Things like housing support, things like supporting students in obtaining driver's license and ID cards providing a shower on campus for students to use, um, a washer and a dryer to wash their clothes, a closet where they can go and get free toiletries or socks if they don't have socks at home, pants, whatever they might need, coats in the middle of winter. We also found that this interpersonal press translated into uh, recognition that the adults in their lives, our students' lives, were willing to go the extra mile. They're willing to show up for a court case. They're willing to pick a student up and give them a ride somewhere. And students also, and this speaks to the perception of our students, the, the ability of our students to see the, um, the ways in which our values transcend every aspect of our school's climate. They noted that the school's flexible budgeting, flexible schedule and flexible edu education program, not only did it not feel like learning, it was also representative of care. It was representative of the fact that we want our students to know that they're first in every decision we make. And that empowered our students to, to take control over their learning. Joy and Amanda, please. Yeah, I think, I think in this part, there's something that from the last slide to here that really sticks to me that's important to emphasize is um, when we're talking about proactive wraparound services, you can see all these different things that we have set up in our program that kids are responding to in, in these interviews that have nothing to do with the recording arts, right? Like we are a hip hop based school that where there's enormous amount of arts engagement, but that is a tool that serves our goal of increasing relationships, student engagement, and increasing care to those young people so that they can work in their hierarchy of needs instead of like the primary focus. And we found it's often extremely integrated. So at our school, sometimes going into the studio where you can get into a booth and you have a, a lyric book full of lyrics that you wrote this summer, you just enroll in the school, giving students the freedom to get in there and just rap and record, getting students the ability to paint, to use kinesthetic movement in the gym or in our dance studio, give students an opportunity to explore what it's like to use a camera and, or what it's like to um, write poetry and perform it for their peers. We think, and we know from our experience and from the feedback we got from students with these interviews that all those things are enormously therapeutic on a really authentic fundamental level for humans, but particularly for teens that have had a really hard time connecting to schools in the past. And when Mike talks about that flexible schedule, one thing that is really important for us to emphasize is we have a, a philosophy of giving students a lot of freedom in our space. It's intentional, it's sometimes dirty and messy and, and can be a challenge because students have to learn to take advantage of it in a way that's productive for themselves, especially if they've had a traumatic experience in schools in the past, but giving students the freedom to go at the pace that they need to be successful has been so important. If you need to spend all week in the gym because you're really going through hell at home, we can, we can accommodate and make that happen and we can be flexible in that way. If you need to get to school in the morning and go right in the studio and just rap for an hour, 
before you get to math class, we can change our structure so that we can do that for you. And that ha has made all the difference in a lot of these interviews we have with young people as they have found it to be a place where they stick and don't jump ship again and go to the next school. Amanda, I don't know if you'd want to add to that, but please jump in. Yeah, I think um, when we're talking about, you know, the students and this kept coming up over and over, I feel like I have a strong relationship with, I think we do a really good job at HSRA um, of not judging the student when they come in. Um, a lot of times, you know, people as human beings, we shut down when we're being judged. And a lot of our students, they're going through very um, personal like situations, you know, before working at HSRA, if you would would have told me like 60% of these kids are homeless or highly mobile, no way, right? I wouldn't believe that. But this is real life. These kids are going through real life experiences. And as an adult, you know, we struggle with some of these things. So as a teenager, to not have that support system, to not have the resources you need in order to be successful, it's it's hard right you know typically we think about people having that support system at home a lot of our kids don't so we are that support system so when we're talking about our four values we mean that you are part of our family right so we are going to support you in whatever you need so a lot of times those students would come and say hey i'm having a really bad day okay what do you need today right like Joey was saying what are the things that you need in order to be successful today um and and just supporting them like joey joey i think you covered it well um but it's whatever you need you know addressing that first so then they can focus on maybe you were in the gym today you just played basketball for three hours or whatever it may be okay so there's physics within that now let's talk about let's talk about it you know right. and and kind of weave in some of that learning so and i think and and i know we got to keep, keep it moving but i think one of the most important important things about the way we frame the study and the way that um, Bill and Ted, who, who helped us work with Wilder on the study, helped us frame it, was to say, our students are coming in with this enormous hierarchy of needs, with these chaotic situations, they're dealing with homelessness, they're doing all this stuff. But let's not focus another study about why schools are failing kids on the backs of those young people. Mm -hmm. Because even though they're going through all these things and they're dealing with the criminal justice stuff system and all these other things, they can still be successful if your school has a structure to, to take those things into account and be adaptive for them. And that's why we were so focused on thinking about what the school does in the study, as opposed to what's going on in your life. Oh, that's the reason why you weren't successful or you're behind or whatever. It's more like, what was your experience in school and how did they work with you through those things? Because we know young people can be resilient even going through really tough situations. Additional stick factors, and we're going to move pretty quickly here through the next slide just to make sure we can get to some questions at the end. But additional stick factors really, uh, uh, in the end, we're rooted in our, our four values of family, respect, community, and education. Time and again, we saw the importance of black affinity in students and staff, recognizing that diverse people make for diverse learning experiences, and that, that also makes for a shared motivation to succeed when a group of people are are able to bond and connect over shared experiences without having first to educate others around them on what those experiences are or convince them that they're real, you can really skip a lot of the stuff that's necessary in conventional schools where uh, young students of color are unable to uh, be recognized for the, the obstacles they face at a systemic level as a result of their race or gender or sexual orientation. This also really led to feelings of safety um, opportunities to reframe failure as positive. Our trauma-informed culture meant that the challenges our students face, just as Joey and Amanda were just talking about, are understood, they're not assumed. Um, we work hard to get to the bottom of what those are and take them into account in a way that deals with uh, student behavioral expectations through a transformative justice lens, a way that tries to move past the conditions that created an issue to a world or a situation that we would prefer. What is it that led to a problem and how can we um, fix that problem? And of course, as we've been discussing an education program, that really starts with this question. What are you interested in? What do you want to learn? How can we structure the school around those interests? Um, this relevant learning looks like educating students for financial literacy through hands-on experiences that imitate real life. Students said that their hobbies, their interests, and their school became the same thing when they came to HSRA. Um, and the incorporation of ethnic studies into our curriculum is a big part of that. 
rooting the lessons that we instruct in the lived experiences and realities of our students without watering down the reality that our students are facing systemic forms of violence such as racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and so forth, uh, poverty, really allows us to engage in really deep, critical conversations with our students that lead to projects they care about, projects that are capable of enabling real world interactions in 21st century competencies and skill sets. And of course, students noted the, the more concrete offerings that we're able to bring to the table, things like travel, vocational or technical training certifications. Just recently, we expanded our offerings to a 13th year uh, studio production and recording arts program called the Diverse Media Institute. We've also expanded our internship and vocational training offerings into a partnership with the state of Minnesota that leverages this year leverages CARES Act funds and historically has leveraged WIOA, WIOA funds at the federal level to uh, pay our students to engage in internships with local service providers in industries that they're interested in. And Joey, let's go to the next slide as well really quickly. Um, there are just a couple push factors worth noting about the high school for recording arts that I think are, are you know, they can extend to a lot of student, a lot of alternative schools, and that is the reputation of alternative schools. It is worth noting also that the students who saw alternative as a, th through a deficit lens, all came back to the high school for recording arts eventually. Um, and while we do have the only Big Ten basketball court in the Midway area in St. Paul, students know that lack of uh, diversity of sports offerings was something that they felt they would have really appreciated um, while they were at the high school for recording arts. Yeah, we, more, more specifically, we don't have a football team, unfortunately. I'd like to say something about the whole alternative status. Um, you know, clearly that term precedes us and it has a lot to do with the fact that we are serving students who are already pushed, kicked out of school and we're re-engaging them. And we need a quote unquote, alter we apply a quote unquote alternative um, um, pathway and, and programming. Um, but actually I believe our school is just a high performing school. Um, I think any young person, and we have many young pe people who come in and have done fine in the traditional system for whatever reason, we just know that our focus is on always continuously making the student who may have the most um, challenges within the educational system predating us to feel comfortable and to feel seen, heard, felt, and able to uh, uh, achieve on the highest level. Um, but I would like to say that for people who look at this study and think that this is only for so-called alternative schools, I believe every school in America regardless as to how you might, one might see it or how they might see themselves, has an alternative, quote unquote, alternative um, population within their building. And the fact that they don't apply a lot of what we're sharing here from what young people are saying that works for them is what leads to the gaps that we have. And, and it's really what will address um, any young person being in any school, being able to have the same kind of feelings and and and, and success that we're we're expressing here. So I see alternative in in its most expansive way, and um, and I hope you do too. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Tony. Uh, I want to invite everybody who has a question to start populating it in in the chat now. We'll try and get to as many as we can. Yeah, we have um, about five minutes left. And while you do that, I want to note that in addition to push-pull stick factors in conventional schools and non-traditional schools, there's also push and stick factors outside of the school, uh, both in the social sphere um, that leads students to either attend or, or depart from a school, as well as in students' personal lives, things like mental health issues, substance abuse, housing, that interact with and, and exchange outcomes with systemic forms of violence like housing discrimination, for example. Um, becoming young parents, we have a fair number of young parents at our school, the number of whom were involved in this study. Uh, family members who may have been incarcerated previously, 
causing students to take on their own jobs, um, or simply the need for a fresh start because an old school climate had become toxic. Some stick factors represented among the population of students we interviewed were becoming a parent. That drove them to actually complete their own high school uh, credentials, as well as one's own aspirations. They just had an implicit motivation to finish school, do the next thing in their lives, and, and move on. And let's go to the next slide, Joey. So what are our recommendations? Well, what are the students' recommendations is the real question. They recommend young, culturally sustaining staff who are capable of maintaining a proper sense of authority, i.e. they view themselves as teachers and not the friends of students. Um, some of our students <laughs> wish that we could separate freshmen from the rest of the school. Uh, it's an interesting insight, one that requires a, a more institutional, a greater institutional shift than we're able to consider at the moment, but we're taking it into account. Um, relevant learning is always something students want more of, even if we offer a, a lot of it already, as well as better food offerings and greater sports offerings. We can jump to the next slide. And so our conclusions were that when, when we put the student at the center, and this is one of our students right there in the middle, and we can personalize the education program to that student through real world project-based learning, most often through the arts, and we're capable of applying interpersonal press to each of these fundamental educational practices, then our students will succeed and we'll be able to provide an environment wherein they feel safe, they feel comfortable to pursue their learning, they feel happy, um, and they want to remain at the high school itself. So we'll put our contact information up here at the end. We'll take any questions that you might have. Um, if you want to reach out to any of us after the fact, you can do so through Twitter. Uh, this research has also been published now through the Wilder Research Foundation. We can see if we can follow up with the Coalition of Independent Charter Schools to provide you with that publication as well. Tony, I'm missing your name on here. I apologize. What is your Twitter, just in case people want to follow you? I'll put it up here for the one we've shared. My Twitter is Tony Mini Apple, T O N Y. M-I-N-N-I-E-A-P-P-L-E. -P -P -E. I'm from New York, live in Minneapolis, Big Apple, Minneapolis, Tony, <laughs> Minneapolis, y'all get it? That's hip hop, whoa. Bars, Tony. <laughs> Love it. Um, I see a comment from Peter, and if anybody else is in here, please leave us a question. We only got a couple minutes left, but Peter, uh, good to see you, man, and, and Northwest Passage is on year two of a ninth grade cohort. We should talk, yeah, we'll be in touch. <laughs> It's a different world dealing with the ninth graders. It's such a cool transition year, uh, but it's it's a challenge for sure. Any anybody else who's in our chat have any questions for us, that, something or something that might have spoke to you uh, in the presentation? <clears throat> I think while we're waiting here too, Amanda, you sat through so many of these. Is there any other insight? that you have um, from how cool youth participatory research can be and how cool this process is for like figuring out from your students exactly what's gonna work in a school. You know, I think the main thing, they wanna talk. <laughs> you know, every student was more than willing to tell their story and give ideas and all of that. So, I mean, just listen, <laughs> you know, that's one of the biggest things um, is just listening to what they have to say. I think a lot of times we, we do a lot of talking as adults, but um, the things that, that come out of each and every one of them, it was just, it was amazing um, to learn more about who they are and their experience and um, just how they, they ended up getting to us. So um, it was challenging towards the end there, recruiting those that have dropped or that have uh, moved on from our school. Um, but it was interesting to find out like each and every one of them had some desire to come back and finish. So um, I guess we're doing something right, right? <laughs> Definitely. I think one of the biggest challenges for this research project is right in the middle of halfway COVID. through us interviewing, yeah, the, the pandemic hit. We moved from all in person in my office working with kids in a camera to all virtual which was crazy, right. you know, but it worked. It did work with Zoom. And so, and, and the kids were still authentic and everything, which speaks to like, if you create the right conditions, young people want to speak, you know, that tagline, nobody ever asked me, 
that's true. We heard that a lot from young people, but more importantly, what you said, Amanda, they also said, we want people to ask us. We, right. That's all we want is, is we want avenues to be able to share our thoughts. Um, and so anybody else who's in this, uh, we appreciate the kind comments in the chat. Anybody else who's in here who wants to uh, work with our school, we do a lot of PD and we do a lot of collaboration with other programs. We'd be happy to share and learn from you as well. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, it, this is a iterative process in our community and we just want to keep serving these youth better and better in every school in, in the community. So we'd love to work with you. I'd like to say just thank you to first you three, you did a great job with this research project. And to all the schools that are part of our coalition community, um, we say we, we do a remix at High School for Recording Arts. Uh, we spent 20 years visiting your schools and other great schools and bringing it back and putting it into the pot and just mixing it together. Um, Amanda takes the big spoon and, and stirs it around. And <laughs> we come out with all of these things that you've heard from our students leading to these research conclusions but it is a result of everyone's great work. I do want to say too that um, a lot of these points are important because even despite the pandemic, because we focus around relationships and all the other um, points that have been made by our young people, we've been able to maintain our enrollment. We've been able to actually increase our attendance through this period. And we know that's counter to what a lot of other schools are experiencing. We're very, mindful of the challenges we have ahead. We know that, you know, every day is a, is, is a greater burden on our students and their families and their community. So we don't sit on that. But at the same time, these things are very foundational to being able to sustain your students engagement with your program, even through crises. So please um, apply them where you can. If you have any great ideas, please let us know so that we can continue to serve all of our students as best we can. All right. Thank you, everybody. Look us up. We'll see you next time.